It's, it's such a nice weather outside and, and, and uh, you made a conscious sacrifice to, to still show up. I appreciate that and, and, and I believe uh, the, today's speakers also do so. Um, also, a uh, special thanks for, for Verif for being such a great host for the uh, second time already. Verif guys, you're awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, one other small announcement, so uh, today's second talk held by Gleb is going to be super interactive and, and uh, he kindly asked you to, to fill in the, the pre-talk uh, form. Um, the link's over there, so if you haven't yet, please do so and, and uh, help him to, to prepare in a better way. Thank you so much for that. And also thanks for uh, thanks to our supporters who, who support uh, Dev Club uh, um, and, and uh, make this this all possible. And for today's agenda, we have uh, two talks. One by Verif's um, uh, Marion Madis on system-wide end-to-end testing, and then another one on uh, on on uh, come. On uh, communication and, and giving feedback and receiving feedback and, and you know talking to people uh, by 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 Deb, who is a, a data driven uh, pitch coach. So this one, as already said, is going to be super interactive. So so buckle up. And and uh, enough of myself. I would like to invite on stage uh, Madis. Please uh, greet him with a warm welcome. <laughs> Let me just quickly set up my computer here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All good here. So, hello, uh, I am Madis. I'm a developer experience engineer here at Verif. And our mission as the developer experience team is to build tools to ensure that the build, test, deploy lifecycle, like the heartbeat of any engineering team, is as frictionless as possible so that our developers can be happy and that they can uh, deploy with confidence. And one of the tools that we built to ensure that uh, is this end-to-end -end testing suite that we run for most of our production deploys. So it's like a mandatory deployment gate uh, that all of the deploys go through. But before I even go there, uh, let me sort out a few things first. So first off, we're here at Verif. And just today, we made this massive change. Uh, we decided to change our branding into this. So if you see people around the office with the, OK, is this better? So if you see people around the office with that logo on the hoodie, they're not imposters. They are also people at Verif. Although my slides will all still have all the old logo, because I didn't really have the time for that. Secondly, let me also talk briefly about our product, what we do here at Verif. So we build base infrastructure for trust online. So offhand, you could say that we help our customers meet their KYC, or uh, know your customers' regulations. So maybe you are opening an account on a crypto exchange, or you want to transfer a large sum uh, over some new fintech bank. We help these companies uh, to verify the users and fight fraud. But that's not all. Uh, this is definitely like one part of a business, but, there, but there's more. It's not only fintech. You could use very also, like let's say you want to order an age-restricted item over a delivery service, or you want to get, want to get access to your work credentials when you've lost them uh, to verify yourself digitally, or maybe you're buying an apartment fully remotely. It's COVID. Uh, you cannot go anywhere, but you still want to buy that apartment. 
So in all of these cases, our product, or we as Verif, we are on this critical path of that customer. We are somebody in the path of somebody trying to open a bank account. We're in the path of somebody trying to buy that apartment. So we're like a key component of that transaction flow. Uh, and to that end, quality is really, re really important to us, to our customers, and finally to these end users like trying to do these things. So how does this work technically? Uh, it's been said that we're a bit like Stripe or like Stripe Payments API. Let's say we have these two counterparts here. We have an astronaut trying to do something, open a bank account, and we have a bank. And this bank makes a call to the Verif API uh, saying that, okay, I want to verify this user. We send back this magic link to this bank that then gets forwarded to this customer uh, where they can go through what we call our verification flow. So maybe they take like a picture of their document, maybe they take a picture of their face, maybe they need to scan some barcodes, doesn't matter that much. We collect all of this data, it goes into Verif to something that we call uh, front. From there, it goes into this magic mystery box called like the Verif decision engine. It's like full of pixie dust and uh, machine learning and matrix multiplications, all of those things. And out of that magic box comes a decision that we send to this bank. Is this person okay or not? Are they trying to perform some fraud or is this a legit thing? And from there, the bank tells the customer, all okay, you can move forward, you can get on with your day. But always like things aren't that pretty. If things aren't going well, our customer could see something like this. Oh no, system hiccup, apologies, let's try again. And obviously it's bad for us as a business because we have like engineers on call, they get a phone call in the middle of the night, they have to wake up, log onto their machines, start fixing stuff. Our customers are unhappy because their conversion rates are dropping. These critical business functions that they do aren't working. And most important of all, there is this person who is looking at the screen on their mobile phone and they are trying to do something. They want to log into their work account, they can't. They maybe need to transfer some money to their relatives abroad and they are stuck. So everybody all around is having a bad day. So to that end, reducing these sorts of incidents is really important for us. Let me take a side trip here as well, how we grew as a company. So today we have around 325 different repositories contributing code to Verif as a product as a whole. And it's up from around 100 in 2018, it would be, or 2019. It would be even more impressive, but we didn't have data going back to like 2017 or these like very, very old days. Similarly, we use microservices, and today we have 150 unique services deployed, up from 60 just, uh, just three, three years ago. And we do about 60 daily deploys to production uh, on average. So every day there are like 60 deploys happening across these 300 plus repositories, across 150 services, so there are so many things that can go wrong there between uh, all of those things. And internally, we have these things that's called in the industry as five nines, which is like five nines of reliability, 99.999% of uptime. And if you take this from a year, it's just a bit more than five minutes. So one side that like any engineer, when they see five nines, what they start thinking about is, okay, we need high availability, multiple clusters. We should use multiple availability zone. What if AWS goes down? Like all of these things, but at the same time, if a bug hits production, those things are not going to help you and you're not going to fix that bug in five minutes usually. So what we want to do is we want to catch these bugs before they even get there, before we make this uh, deployment, before we start counting down from that five minutes per year. So it's, it's not a lot. And I know what you are all thinking here, like you should use unit tests, you should use integration tests, you should do manual testing, you should do contract testing. Like all of those things are awesome and we do all of these as well. But as you know, unit tests can have like a bit of a downside to them. You're typically testing like one service as a whole, like one window in isolation here. Once you put them all together, it turns out it doesn't actually work. Uh, so we want to catch these bigger failures 
where multiple services figure out like oh that actually doesn't work or maybe there is a message being passed between three different systems and there is a fourth one listening in that nobody even knew about we change the format of this message we go to production we think everything is good and then boom there's an incident again so we try to do as much testing as we can across all of these layers but today I'm going to talk about end-to-end -end testing so this concept that we take very as a whole all of these services and we test it as one piece to just to discover these uh, integration issues so if we talk about end-to-end -end testing as a signal so let's imagine that our product is a plane that we are flying and you're in the cockpit of the plane there are like multiple tiles everywhere you can see like the altitude you're flying at your airspeed what's the air pressure what's your location I don't know powers of the engines all kinds of stuff and similarly, we have all kinds of metrics about our services. How they are doing in production, how is our code coverage when we are still developing and testing, and so on and so on. And end-to-end, -end, it doesn't give you almost any of that. It's like this one very small dial in the middle of the cockpit that's giving you like one very strong binary signal. Is the plane on fire or not? It doesn't tell you anything about where are we flying, are we flying in the right direction? Like how is the plane going? It just tells you, is it even on fire? Can we like fly this thing at all? Does it even work? So that's, that's the problems we had and that we decided to solve uh, with end-to-end -end testing. And before we even got to implementation, we agreed upon a few core principles that this test suite should cover. So let me go over these uh, one by one. And they're in rough order of priority. So first off, this test suite needs to be stable. When we run this test suite, let's say with only production versions, it should always pass. So if it starts failing, and first off, people start distrusting it. It's like, ah, this signal, that dial is going all over the place all the time anyway. Uh, why, why, why should we even look at this? So it gets flaky, developers start uh, distrusting it, and at that point, there's, there's really no point for this check. The other side is, it really needs to be fast this is on the hot path of any deployment so it should be at least 15 minutes or less if it gets longer than that then the original engineer who is doing the deployment they don't have time to wait for this they will go for lunch for coffee they will forget about the deployment it goes live nobody's monitoring at this point anymore uh, so it should be as quick as possible just to reduce the amount of friction that uh, we put on the developers it should also mirror the most common traffic in production. I gave this uh, old mobile app version uh, before as an example, but let's imagine 80% of our users are using this old mobile app version. We should test on that. There is no value in testing like some latest version that is actually not in production yet, because we are not catching any of these backwards compatibility issues. They could still be, uh, still be happening. And I guess the most controversial one is that the test suite would only exercise the public API and the interaction surface. So the test would be a true black box test. It wouldn't know anything about this uh, magic pixie dust box there. It would just exercise these API front and let's say these phone interfaces as our customers would, as our users would. So if I would put end to end as boxes here, end to end would be playing the part of the bank the customer, and then to end would be playing the part of the user who is actually doing interactions on that phone. So we have our core principles in place, and it's nice to uh, nice to put them in place. But you need to monitor them as well. How well are we doing with this? So we built a dashboard. We monitor our runtime for all of these. Uh, recently we're doing quite well, so we are fast, we are below that uh, 15 minute mark. We are also monitoring flakiness, so we run this test suite nightly on versions that we think are good, and whenever it fails it gives us a signal that the test suite itself is bad. 
So we aren't doing that well there right now. It's like 81%. And we revisit this dashboard every other week just to see how we're doing. And if we have regressions, we can figure out, okay, we, we probably need to change our course here. We need to, uh, we need to do something. Yeah, and we, we still got a bunch of challenges to go like this flakiness here. Cool, so that's the, that's the very basic idea or the goal of what we wanted to achieve. Uh, I'll talk a bit about implementation and I'll start off with some maths, but I'm not gonna show you any ugly formulas, anything like that. Let's have nice little boxes and shapes. So let's say we have a set of services that we know that work well together. So we have a bunch of microservices here. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are round. And we already have this set. We can call this production. So if there is a problem in production, then somebody gets a phone call. Then a developer wakes up and they fix it. So we can assume that production at least is always working or otherwise we don't have a working product. We don't really have a company. And in this nice set of services, Let's say we have one specific service that we call maybe core, and it has 3.14 as a version. So what this end-to-end uh, -end test suite is built to answer is this very simple question. If we replace this version with a newer version, uh, let's say core 3.15, would this cause an incident or not? Would our plane still be running or would it be on, uh, on fire? And the easiest way for us to do that is we create this test environment that's very close to production. Like all of these other services, they have the same version. But we take out this core 3.14 that was deployed there, we take 3.15 instead, we put it into this test environment, and now we run our test. So at this point, the only thing, like mathematically assuming that our test suite is 100% deterministic, it always works, the only thing that we changed is this version of this one service. So if this is good to go, we know with some degree we can put this to production. It can still go as an incident. This isn't like a perfect, uh, fully covered test suite by any, any manner. But if this fails, then we know with a certainty, like, okay, we shouldn't put this into production. This is going to cause trouble. And if all is good, it goes to production. So it becomes part of this uh, new set of good services. Our uh, production services are updated. A bit of background here as well. I will go very briefly over it, but I hope we're going to have a chance to do another talk about this because this part of the rift is really awesome. Uh, we deploy things called through a, uh, we deploy things through a tool called Deploy Manager. So anytime there is a build in our CI system, we use Circle CI. It sends a Docker container off to container registry, and it also lets Deploy Manager know this thing has been built. And from there, Deploy Manager knows, like, okay, we have these Kubernetes clusters, let's say production and staging, I can deploy there. But there is a third very, very cool option. Uh, we have these temporary Kubernetes namespaces called review environments. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the important part here is this is a copy of Verif. Like any engineer at Verif can go into Deploy Manager, just start pressing a few buttons and say, like, I want to create a review environment that has default versions from production, and I want to add this service there with this specific version that I want. So very similar to what we wanted for our end-to-end -end test suite, and we had this already. So we just took these review environments for our, uh, for our test framework. On the other hand, for our mobile SDKs and our web, we were doing UI testing already. So it took some work, but we used the knowledge from that to build that part uh, of the system that would like, press these buttons uh, every time. And once we have the test suite, we can move forward to the deploy gates. So we leveraged all of this functionality and we built this way to build up review environments uh, and start, start gating the deploys. And let me walk through how that works as well. So first off, there comes an engineer they say, I want to deploy this core of 3.15, push it to production. Deploy manager would ping this other service called end-to-end -end orchestrator. And it would ask, is this version any good? End-to-end -end orchestrator internally would have some sort of queue, let's say a deploy queue, 
where it starts picking off these services one by one. So currently, core 3.15 is blocked. There's something in the way there. Uh, but soon, it would process that one, and then it would get on to core 3.15. Now, end-to-end -end orchestrator will go back to Deploy Manager saying, give me a review environment with production versions, but this core 3115 in there as well. And Deploy Manager is very happy to oblige. Uh, it will give, create a new review environment, deploy everything in there, put this new service in there. End-to-end -end orchestrator will kick off this end-to-end -end test suite, run all of those things uh, with this new version, and then finally tell Deploy Manager, yeah, this this version is awesome, uh, let's deploy it. And Deploy Manager will go on to do just that. So let's say things are not that rosy, something goes wrong. In that case, obviously there is no deployment. But at the same time, we also provide some debug data for the developer uh, to see what went wrong. So there's a lot of information here, but the important bit is it's a product called Allure that we are very happy with. Uh, and it will give you this drill down option of going into like seeing the DOM for instance or seeing the requests that are made and see the exact step that failed there. So now, now we are all good, right? Uh, the talk is done. We are like, we have built end to end test suite. Well, not so fast. So things really work out that easy. By building it, we had a bunch of challenges. So first off, uh, this back and forth that I showed you this queue and end-to-end -end orchestrator. If I lay it all out, it looks something a bit like this. And for us at this point, this complexity with the queue was a bit too much. So sometimes the queue would just get stuck. And that means uh, no deploys whatsoever for any developers uh, until somebody goes and unblocks it. We were also doing some, this performance uh, hack or optimization where we would reuse review environments and sometimes some state would get stuck there and it would start failing all of the next builds. So it would all, again be like a bad time, somebody would need to go in there and fix it and until then all of these deploy gates were failing. Uh, so we decided to do away with the queue, come up with something like much simpler. Deploy manager, it already knows that it, when it's going to tell an orchestrator like test this that it's going to require a review environment. And all of this back and forth was really, really unnecessary. So we ended up with a much simpler solution where Deploy Manager, when doing the deploy, it will immediately create this and just ask end-to-end -end orchestrator to test this, and then it will get a reply back whether it's good or not. Now, there is a downside here. As we don't have any queues, then at this point, let's imagine this, I would say unlikely, but this scenario that we have two services getting deployed simultaneously. And if we test one of them in isolation, everything is good. And if we test another one of them in isolation, everything is also good. But there is something in communication between these two services that if we put them into production, uh, then they will cause an incident. And at this point, at our size and the number of deploys we do, we just looked at it and we decided like, this is worth the risk. Our deploy frequency isn't high enough uh, that we can test these things in parallel. We don't need this fully rigid deploy queue. Like we are not Uber or Google or uh, one of those companies yet that need this level, uh, this level of tooling. So we simplified this a lot. Another part, going into this allure, like this massive page of information, was a bit cumbersome, and it was a bit hard to understand what went wrong there. Uh, so we built a tiny Slack bot that would do this for you. It would log into Allure, it would gather all of this data and just take the most important bits and put this in a Slack message. So when the end-to-end -end gate did fail, as it sometimes does, you would get a quick overview of which job, which step failed, what were the actions taken just before the failure. We had a few other challenges I'm gonna go over it really, really quickly. So one of them was getting this test suite under 15 minutes. We've been working with end to end, I think, for about uh, two years, and we got below this magical 15 minute run uh, runtime just a few months ago, even though it was the original goal uh, all the time. We had like iOS SDK builds taking too much time, so we actually took them out uh, and we're planning to put them back in there. Uh, as long as uh, as long as they're fast, 
But it's a great example of trade-offs. Like similarly, how I showed before with deploy queue, sometimes you just want to cut this complexity out to get something uh, else for it, for instance, speed. Uh, and we, we had a similar problem here. We also switched our tests over, so this is getting a bit technical, uh, over from Cypress to Playwright. Playwright is a much faster framework for uh, testing. I don't know too much about that, but we have Riffians somewhere here that do. Uh, so if you want to talk about that, go go ask him. Uh, pop down over there. Uh, we also had this, or still have, this massive challenge that our data topology or database topology in production is very complex. So we have multiple tiers of databases. They have multiple shards. There's like all crazy replication paths. I think there are only a few, well, a handful of engineers at Riff who completely understand it. And in these review environments, we had one puny database that's so trying to play the roles of all of these. So this would sometimes cause problems because we wouldn't notice uh, failures due to this more complex system in production. And also some of the apps would be untestable. They wouldn't even work in review environments. So this is something we are working on right now to try to bring these two worlds uh, closer. Another huge challenge is service coverage itself. So today, out of these 150 services, roughly 100 are something that we would call critical. 50 are more like, let's say, tooling or uh, something that, well, no service should ever be down, but possibly something when it's down, it's not really causing an incident. But 100 of those are, would cause an incident if they're down. And today we are using these deploy gates about, let's say, half of those. And it's closely related to this uh, last part that the data stack between the review environments and our production is uh, so different. Also, local development of this test suite itself is a massive pain. So, we don't have a way to do, the, to do it today. You would make changes to the test suite, run the test suite with a deploy manager, and wait for the reply. Even though it's fast for the gate, it's like 15 minutes, and getting a feedback loop for your deployment of 15 minutes or like your changes. You make a change, you press run, you wait, a few, cup of, uh, few cups of coffee, you come back, that's no, no way to develop. And today, we don't have any way to do this locally. We're thinking of it, but it's, it's, a, it's a massive pain. And debugging all of these issues in this test suite uh, is still very hard. Because if something goes wrong, it can be in any one of those uh, services that is participating in this test suite. So for us, at least so far, this pretty much been the case that we need a dedicated person. We have like the point man for this test suite. It started off a bit of a side project between like various people in the developer experience, in the quality engineering team, but it wasn't really like the top of the priority or like full time job for anyone. So here and there like balls were dropped. So that's 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 really important that at least we found for now with the issues we're having with this, we need a dedicated person. And a few takeaways as well, just not to finish this on a sour note of like all these problems and issues and, uh, and things. Overall, this test suite is working. Every now and when we do catch issues, and sometimes quite bad issues, before they hit production. Uh, and if you build something like this, you should celebrate this. You have spent all of this massive engineering time building a test suite, and it's working, you are avoiding so much pain for the on-call engineers, for the customers, most importantly for the end users uh, who can proceed with their day. And I, I think even we were probably not celebrating these enough. Uh, we should definitely do more. And another takeaway for you, like, should you introduce a desk suite like that at your company, at your workplace, uh, when you go back to it tomorrow? Well, it really depends. Like, do you have the right product? Do you have the right amount of people? If you're a team of five, I would say no. But if you are maybe at our size, or let's say your bolt or wise, I don't know where anyone is here, uh, why not? Especially if you have a product like us, where everything is so transactional. Most of the time, going through the session for the end user takes a couple of uh, 
minutes at the most. So we have like a very, very clear cut one single flow that we want to test. Let's say you're bot and you're doing uh, ride shares. Similarly, you have a very clear user interaction. They order a taxi, it goes to the driver, uh, sorry, not taxi, a car. Uh, the driver drives around them, picks them up, takes them to the destination. You can leave the rating at the end and boom, done. Like this is their product, it's very transactional. It could work there as well. But let's say you're building an ID, or let's say you're building GitHub. GitHub doesn't really have this, like one core thing that should work. So I imagine if they had an end-to-end -end test suite, it would, it would probably be massive. Uh, so yeah, if you have the right product at a certain size, absolutely. But do plan accordingly as well. This is like an effort uh, in manpower, uh, in complexity, in time, in all of those things. But at the end of the day, it is catching issues, so it, uh, it can be worth it. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Do we have a mic as well? Yeah. Wait a minute until it turns on. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the talk. So my question would be, do you have any kind of metrics or KPIs that you use to measure the health of your engineering teams or the code base? Yes, a lot of them. Uh, not too many in automated, uh, automated ways. And Deed, you will start waving if I talk too much, right? Like, anything <laughs> forbidden. So we have, we have this, uh, I would say, like an sort of an audit of the engineering teams and their code bases, uh, which is done manually and we just grade in all different areas. Like, how is your tests? How is your, I don't know, logging? Uh, how do you do deployments? What are your development processes like? So that's one side that's done manually. And on the other hand, we have this uh, tool called Service Visibility Tool. So we have really boring and straightforward names here at Riff. And this tool goes into all of the GitHub repositories, enumerates them, and then collects data from different sources to also get like some, uh, like, some measurement into what is this repository doing. Uh, is it like using a latent version of Node, or is it behind, or stuff like that. Mm. In-house filter. Yes, at the moment, yes. Thanks. Uh, over there, please. Uh, you said that uh, debugging is a problem, but uh, why? Uh, you can't create a review environment or safe review environment which is broken, I mean, uh, where, which is green, or which is red. So, and yeah, yeah, debugging wise, the biggest problem is just. Uh, If it's the service that is at fault, that's the easy case. So end-to-end -end is working as it should and it's stopping a bad deployment. But let's say we have a flaky test suite, uh, or like some services sometimes behaving badly. And then we have like, all of these microservices where the failure could originate from, and debugging that going through all of these logs, uh, that, that's the difficult part. So we need an engineer who is like, at least capable of uh, debugging any service that we do, uh, which is which is a hard ask on anybody. If that answered your question. Uh, but uh, developers can create a review environment for their needs and uh, do checks uh, on some of the data What is yeah. on under your um, employer, this uh, manager? Mm -hmm. So is it a Helm chart or something like that? It is also completely in-house. Uh, <coughs> I would say it's something like Helm, but it's a bit more it's a bit more complex. So I would love to talk about this. I could do this for an hour probably, uh, but I hope we will have a talk on deploy manager separately. So it's similar to Helm. It's an abstraction layer between our own like uh, service manifests and the Kubernetes stuff uh, that is happening. Thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, and what about other type of tests, like uh, unit integration? We do, we do all of them, even including manual tests. Like a great example is we have Android and iOS SDKs, and there we don't really deploy services, we ship binaries. And with binaries you have this uh, awesome feature that once they're out there and somebody grabs them, you cannot really roll back anymore. They're, they're there, they're live, 
Uh, so, for instance, with these like very, I would say like restrictive environments quality-wise, there we even employ manual testing. But we do, uh, we do unit testing, we do integration testing, all of those other layer of testing. One thing that we don't do today that we have been looking at is doing uh, contract testing, which would definitely be a useful tool as well uh, with that many services. But it also requires this pretty high like upfront investment uh, of actually building out the schemas, the contracts, uh, the tooling around to like enforce them, test them, so on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, can you pass it over there? Thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, just a quick question. Is it part of the developer team to write those tests or you have a dedicated team? And also, does it include performance testing somehow? Uh, performance testing is a separate topic. It's using review environments as well, but that's uh, separate from end-to-end -end testing. Test suite-wise, uh, it's a bit of a shared responsibility right now between a team we have called quality engineering. But ideally, and most of the time, the teams uh, who have to put this. So let's say I have a, I have a very like uh, well-defined product like the SDK, or let's say one of these public APIs that is being hit. Then those teams are expected to own that part of the end-to-end -end test suite to make sure that it's up to date. At the end of the day, they are owning their service, they are doing refactorings there, they know when we also need to update the desk suite to uh, match that. Oh, hello. Uh, well, yeah, thank you for the talk. It reminded me a good old days of one of my previous companies. And uh, the question, uh, well, it's strange nobody asked it yet, uh, so it should be me. Uh, how much e 2 tests do you have? I mean, uh, the usual, uh, the biggest possible uh, the suit size under these 15 minutes. Uh, it is very small right now. Oh, I think we have like eight sessions going through from various sources. Uh, but it's like the test itself, one test case is quite literally end to end. So it starts with collecting the data, it goes through our system, all the way to like these decision webhooks that are being sent back to the customer. So that's like one test case, and currently we have uh, like seven or eight uh, of these. We definitely oh, plan. Yeah. Uh, did, did, uh, sorry, did I get it right? Uh, just seven U2 tests. Yeah. Yes. Ah, ah, okay. That is like covering the whole transaction flow itself. So it's like a one very uh, more of like a one very wide test that's testing everything instead of like one test case being very uh, narrow and testing one thing. For these uh, narrow, like let's say more specific use cases, there are better tools for that. Uh, it's like integration tests, unit tests, things that are much more easier to debug and where the failures are uh, much, much more clear. Yeah, okay, thank you. Again, okay. Thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, and on the slide where you have like a bunch of box of brief, you mentioned also machine learning. Uh, how you approach testing machine learning models, because it's kind of not deterministic, so all predictions depends on data which you pass, and kind of updated, updated predictions updated, so uh, do you have like a general approach how to test machine learning models? Mm -hmm. uh, so, first off, like I'm a full out engineer, like I write code, I don't train models. Nothing better, it's like awesome that we have people that do. So I don't know too much about this part. Uh, it's deterministic enough for the end-to-end -end test case. But similarly, like somebody asked before, performance testing, we also have a, like a model testing framework built on the review environment and like a similar approach to this, that uh, you can deploy specific machine learning models and you can drive like, let's say, a thousand sessions through them more and more and like see, see how everything works, uh, how your model behaves. But I'm, it's too much out of my wheelhouse to like give you any more details here. Alright, thanks. So let's let's put in one one last question. If anyone volunteers, yeah. Um, tough luck, I have for. <laughs> um, so, uh, first question: Do you have a, an exception in your pipeline to avoid waiting for the end-to-end uh, -end test to complete, just because you have five minutes to react to an incident, right? To triage an incident. And you have to wait 13 minutes, so I assume you have some sort of like exception, right? Some sort of avoid well, function. 
it uh, the actual test so it goes before the deploy. So we don't even go to production before this 30 minutes is passed. Yeah, but let's imagine I have to write a hotfix for a production failure. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, obviously, there is like a checkbox. You can skip this if you want to. And how do you like? How are you making sure that it's not abused this function to bypass it? Like with everything else, we measure it. So we have data and the dashboard where you can see how often it is uh, skipped. All right. And just out of curiosity, how much time does it take to spin up the uh, review environment? <laughs> Bogdan is showing me four. Four uh, minutes. Around four minutes. All right. And my last question is: Do you use Allure Enterprise by any chance, or is it just reporting tool? It's a Allure Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. There's actually one last that, that came in on YouTube by Dmitry P. So how much tests do you have that run under 15 minutes? So it's seven, I guess, right? Yes, yes. And currently all of them, 100% okay. uh, okay. times. It's currently okay. faster. Cool, cool. Uh, Marius. Great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, pizzas are here. So let's take uh, some 15 minutes break and then uh, come back together for, for the second talk. Uh, I'll like them. Thank you. Thank you. 
Enjoying your pizzas. I am glad we're going to meet roughly in, I think, 10 minutes. I kindly but firmly and respectfully ask people who have not submitted their forms to go to this QR code to go there and fill in the form. It takes you three minutes. Three minutes. For people who are not exactly not understand what's for, I'm going to be showing this data during today's talk. Go to the QR code and please fill it in. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. For people who don't understand who the heck I am, I am a coach fundamentally. How many of you have ever worked with a coach? It's a fancy term. Please raise your hand. Okay. Most of you have not. Okay. Understood. Now, people who are blocking the way, just keep in mind there's a bunch of people in the back. Please make some way. Thank you. Now, a coach's job is not, on paper, it's not very complicated. You're supposed to ask questions, plain and simple. And there's a lot of listening involved, plain and simple. Now, how many of you today currently are in leadership positions? And I mean, you can be a, an engineering manager, you can be a VP, you can be CTO, but do you have direct people you work with? All right, hands up. People in the back, pick, All right, leadership positions, any leadership positions, okay, very good. So people who are working with other people, well, part of your job description is to provide feedback. Now, quite a few of you maybe are learning a thing. Maybe you're freelancers, right? Maybe you get customer feedback. Now, but how do you give it? How do you give it in such a way that a person doesn't start fighting you all the way and actually starts acting on the feedback that you provide? Now, I'll level with you. There's a big, thick book here. 
Now, I know to some of the very folks probably read, and there's a bookshelf. So I will be giving a lot of book recommendations throughout the whole session. One is by a guy who spent 30 years studying baboons in Africa. Now, I am perfectly aware that you guys are, well, anything from quality assurance to CTOs, VPs of engineering, front-end developers, back-end developers, and so forth, and so forth, and whatever you want to put in. DevOps, data scientists, right? Somebody talks about flaky tests. Somebody talks end-to-end, -end, right? But I'm going to talk about baboons a little bit. Now, Robert is available on YouTube. I think he teaches at Stanford, if I'm not mistaken, and he teaches everything from, well, inheritance to biology. Now, some of you understand that you are animals, and this is a key component of today's talk. You have to understand that you are animals. Now, I am not talking about that. I'm not calling you apes. What I am talking about is that you have the same responses as human beings as some of the apes do. One of them is fight or flight. Now, how many of you have heard of fight or flight. Now, how many of you have experienced fight or flight? Okay. Now, some of you might experience it, some of you will not. Right? In my job as a pitch coach, as somebody helps people communicate in a short amount of time, I have to get plenty of feedback, and sometimes I'm the reason for fight or flight or freeze. Now, the confessions to be made. Now, you don't need to pay attention to anything on the screen. You might have picked up that I don't have slides today. All you need to focus on is me, for now. Now, I will be showing you data, and that form you submitted will be used. But today, I want to give you a few books and a few ideas, because we simply have 40 minutes, and I want to make it practical for all of you at some point. So what does it mean, Raves? Now, it means we have these responses. So somebody gives you feedback, either in the code you've written, or the timing when you submitted or deployed it, or in a hiring decision, if you get any feedback at all, you're still apes. Now, more specifically, you're social apes. And you care about what other people think of you, even if you deny it. Now, this gentleman is from MIT, Alex Pentland, social physics. I kind of recommend it. I think people from Nortel might know him, if I'm not mistaken, even came to Stone, I think, once or twice. Now, Alex, Alex studied quite a few things using trackers before we had all of these little fancy watches. And he tracked patterns of interaction between human beings. And he calls it idea flow. So if you have a team of roughly I don't know, five, six, seven people, and you put a bunch of trackers on them, and you see who talks more and who talks less, well, these conversational patterns might reveal quite a bit. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about just now? OK, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. All right, how many of you have been in a meeting? OK. How many of you had a person do 80% of the talking? Some guy or lady talks in the meeting 80% of the time. OK, that's information flow. The person that dominates the meeting. How many of you enjoy those meetings? Hands up. I don't know if the cameraman can direct attention, but there are zero hands. OK? Now, what's critical to understand in the social dynamic is that evolution, if we go back to Robert Sapolsky in the first book, doesn't throw stuff away. The new layers, so anything from neocortex, your prefrontal cortex, your ability to well analyze that code you've written, end-to-end -end testing, all that new stuff, is still built on top of the old stuff. That means that if Somebody who is more important, your boss or a key account, the grand pooba is still in the room, they will dominate the goddamn conversation. Now, it has, that has a cost, and it has a massive cost of that information flow. Key pieces, bits of feedback are not given. You start wasting a lot more time just because one person does the talking. Translation, guys, you have to speak up, yes? not have person talk most of the time. Now, if my experience with engineers is of any guidance, they're not known for their ability to, uh, how should I put this, help me out, um, talk to other people. Now, it's again a generalization, and there's always exceptions. 
So a great part of my work is having actually human beings stand in front of other human beings and to convey what they do, who they are, why they do what they do, what maybe their ask is in a short amount of time, anything from one minute to three minutes. In fact, one of the first times I was in the offices of Verif is when it had just only six people, I think. It was downstairs. All right? So I meet a lot of different individuals. Finally, the third book for now is by Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen. Some of you know difficult conversations that they have written, right? Harvard Negotiation Project. So if you want to understand social physics, if you want to start biology and you want to understand how to navigate those meetings and get to the decisions faster, or in the same time not to have to fight fires all the time, all this stuff matters. So read the books. I don't have enough time to explain all this, honestly. So I'm going to give you some reading. All right? In the Thanks for the Feedback book, they outline three different types. One is appreciation. It's about relationships. I appreciate you. So I appreciated little puzzles. I think Andre, if I'm not mistaken, did during the last talk we had, as in the Dev Club at WISE. I really appreciate how he engaged the audience with these little puzzles that I was part of. Right? I'm appreciating. I'm saying he's really good at that. Really cool, really experienced speaker. Right? It's a relationship thing, but I'm also honest about it. The second type of feedback is coaching, right? That's what I do. Now, that can be separated, and again, two different elements. One is when there's a particular skill, measurable skill. Maybe you're learning a slack line, like I do, right? Walking on a rope. Maybe you're learning chess. Maybe you have clear data telling you how, what's the error rate. It's immediate feedback that you can see and act on. Another one is a relationship type of coaching. So is the team working well together? So newbie leaders have this. Now the third and final one, is probably you guys know this, is evaluation, so performance reviews. Something that tells you exactly where you stand. Your compensation might depend on that. All right, so three different types. Appreciation, coaching, and evaluation. You're going to be getting all three today. And here's what's going to happen for now. Now, we know that we're animals. We know that we're social animals. We know that there's an information flow in meetings or events. And normally, it's not exactly evenly distributed. But it needs to be for better decisions to be done over time. And we know there's three different types of feedback, which are, what's the first one? Appreciation. Appreciation. What's the second one? And the third? Evaluation. Very good. I need you to remember that. All right? Now, I'm going to do something today. And that is, I'm going to test the previous speaker. And hopefully, the speaker is here. And hopefully, he's away. All right? With your consent, obviously. Absolutely. Do I need another beer? Or? You don't need another beer. But I would do suggest to pay attention to it. So first, we're going to learn to provide basic feedback. We're going to go for basic things, which I use in my work. Right? How many of you would be able to introduce this man, and Verif employees not included, Verif employees not included. How many of you would be able to introduce this man by name to a friend of yours? Please raise your hand. Fair enough. Thank you for your honesty, and thank you for what? Thank you for the feedback. OK, let's continue. Now, people generally tell me this, oh, Gleb, I'm not really good with names, right? It's like, I don't remember names. There's a reason for this. But who is he? How many of you would be able to, in explicit, so specific terms, explain to a friend of yours, let's say a friend, an engineer, who this man is? Specific terms, hands up. How many of you would be able to explain who this man is? Raise your hand. Specific terms. Not, Oh, he works for Verev, and I think he does to do some testing. That is not specific. It's ballpark. OK. Hands up. All right. Are you seeing this, man? OK. We're testing it. All right. How many of you, now this is a tricky one, so tell me if I'm not clear. How many of you would be able to explain to a good friend of yours? Right? So something tells me you're friends or something. Right? How many of you will be able to explain why this man does his job? It could be on a logical level, but beyond the money. Right? 
How many of you would be able to explain the reason he does his job, the purpose of his job? Please raise your hand. Okay, please. Your, okay, this is a little better, right? So your metrics are improving a little bit. All right. Very good, very good. All right. Final question. Now, he mentioned some of issues that vary faces, some challenges. How many of you would be able to name one challenge that Verve has? How many of you would be able to name two? Three. OK. Now, why did I perform this test, ladies and gentlemen? Well, all right, you can obviously see whether somebody pay attention, but you were still, you were active. You were asking questions, right? You were a captive audience. Not that Verif is holding you captive, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Why did I do this test? Did we the efficiency of the previous speaker? Well, efficiency is a big term here, you know, it takes a lot of time, but yes, to, to evaluate, right? To provide some form of clear, actionable feedback to the previous speaker. We evaluated the speaker. Now, what does that, right, what is the range of outcomes? What is the potential outcomes if somebody does that? So you're quite charitable, you're quite honest, and I asked consent, and you, you, know, you were kind about it. But let's say, have you ever had a leader who would get defensive? Somebody, when receiving feedback, would not react very well. Now, it doesn't have to be a leader, it can be a coworker. How many of you ever had a coworker that would not react well when provided with feedback of this type? Okay. Are you guys starting to get the idea what this talk is about? No. <laughs> but thank you. Okay. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your honesty. All right. I used a very specific context here. Somebody does a talk. We looked at three basic things, who you are, what you do, why you do it. How many people retained it? How many didn't? What did they retain? Now put this in your own context. Are you doing a summary, let's say a stand-up, what you're working on right now? I think they also have these three questions they ask, slightly different ones. An all-hands meeting, a growth marketing event, Let's say a hiring event. You're, at, you're essentially sponsoring this because you need engineers, most likely, or any different QA testers. What will they remember about the company? Now, you can put this in different contexts. How many of you have done freelancing work? Customers, freelancers, heads up. Freelancers, OK? Has your customer given you feedback? All right. Listen, guys, so I collected quite a bit of data for you. Let me put this into context. We had 122 responses. Many of you submitted this today. Let's see. What did it show me? Well, it showed me, surprise, surprise, you work in IT. It showed me computer software, it showed me quite a bit of finance too. But it also showed me something very, very interesting. And I will be sharing this with you today. Yeah, quite a few, right? We have an almost, well, a 50-50 split in terms of who's in a leadership position and somebody who maybe is maybe a junior, a specialist, all that type of stuff. So CTOs, VPs, engineering, obvious leaders, managers. Most individuals here are somewhere on the middle track. They're put like this. They kind of agree they will be comfortable with public speaking. But something tells me if I would invite you here, that situation might change very quickly. <laughs> All right? Which I'm going to be doing. How likely are you to basically give feedback to others? Now, most of you look at that. You're very likely to provide feedback to others. People who filled in the form, great. People like giving feedback, positive feedback. It's easy. There's no cost. You just said something nice. Your flaky test talk was great. But now the situation starts getting a little more tricky. 
That's still relatively high. I'll expect much lower. I'll expect much lower numbers when it comes down to providing challenging feedback. Let's say if I would start criticizing your talk, or the same way you would criticize my talk. So it's, it's still pretty high, but it's lower than the positive one. So no surprises there. Now they're asking, but you're all saying you're asking. A lot of you are willing. All right, somewhere in the middle, positive. And look, look, look at this. And then suddenly it starts shifting. Suddenly you guys starting saying that I, you know, I want challenging feedback. I prefer receiving challenging feedback. So let me compare that once again. We have like a, almost a normal distribution a little bit for the positive, and suddenly it starts getting skewed to the right. All right, fair enough. You guys are a bunch that wants to get challenging feedback. That's the immediate naive assumption I'm making, but wait a minute. Let's start asking which type of feedback had an effect on your long-term performance. It can be anything from coding to your career. Look at that. All right, you guys are saying challenging feedback is important. But what's the kind of feedback that you actually receive? <coughs> so wait a minute. You told me, or at least a large chunk of you told me and more, that you are very likely, or moderately likely, to give challenging feedback. You believe that challenging feedback is more effective for long-term performance. And most of you receive positive feedback. <laughs> Am I missing something? No, no, it's so okay. Okay. What do you guys see? Somebody lies. <laughs> Excuse me? Somebody lies. Somebody lies. Now to be fair, it's a simplistic form, right? I needed to complete it. I needed three minutes, right? Obviously, I would like to make it more granular, little, maybe provide you with the scales. But now, this is a feedback paradox. It has a name. So going back to apes and Robert Sapolsky, here's a tool that I, as a coach, have to keep in mind. People who work with users or usability testing of any kind, let's say I have a user. And I want to understand this user. There's many frameworks, right? You don't have to go to the Estonian Art Academy and you know, do all these studies. There's something what the user tells you. I want a bigger button. I want more challenging feedback. They might even think that. They might even think that they want it. But what do they actually do? And what do they actually feel? Now this is a tool. How many of you know this tool? I've heard of this type of tool. Not too complicated, is it? It's called empathy mapping. Think of it as a mental model, how people think. And that's a part of my job as a coach, is to help shape your mental models. Now, the data I collected is a convenient way to highlight a discrepancy. We get it. Most of you receive positive feedback, and you claim that you would receive, well, provide challenging feedback, and you want it. So what are we going to do? I need volunteers. I don't know how much time I have. Let's see. I have timed myself for 20 minutes. I want to dedicate these 20 minutes to as many of you as I can to make it real. Now, it's easy to pick on a more you know, experienced speaker in a leadership position, but let's start getting everybody else. I need maybe three of you for now. W one by one, a person comes here. Think of it as a stand-up. And you tell me who you are, what you do, and why. That's it. Nothing else. You tell me who you are, you tell me what you do, and why. You're going to stand in front of this tribe and communicate this in a very short amount of time. Maximum three minutes. Can I do this? You absolutely can. Hand of applause for Victor. Please, Victor, join us on stage. I'm going to give you my microphone and take another one. 
You will have roughly three minutes, and the structure is very basic. And all of you, you're going to be giving feedback. Who you are, what you do, and why you do it. You can improvise, you can change things, you will give in three minutes. But your job is to make sure that people retain what you said. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. I'll give you the mic. All right? By the way, should I use all three minutes? You don't have to. <laughs> it is a basic framework, guys. You can do whatever the hell you want. I will not be offended, right? But it's up to you. Okay. Stage is yours. Uno, dos, tres. Let's do it. Okay. <coughs> Hello, my name is Victor, and I'm a project director in VoiceOver. So I'm a former engineer, and most of my life I spent as an engineer. But at some point of my career, I wanted to understand things better. Louder, I mean, please. Louder, OK. Now it's better? OK, cool. So, at one point, I, co I converted to salesperson and then to product, to product domain. So now I understand, uh, and I want to understand better how exactly things works in terms of you know user behavior, product uh, you know specific terms, and so on. So, on. so uh, that's that's my that's my way, okay. And why I'm doing this? Because I cannot do it another way. I just. You know, I want to make things better in, uh, you know, in any mini nonsense. So it it haven't it, it has impacted in my life in all the aspects of it. It's, it's it's about my career, it's about my you know kids, and it's about myself because uh, myself like I perceive myself as a product as well. So all my life is product. So I make myself better as a product. So every day, my personal product is a little bit better than before. That's why I'm here. And I'm learning a lot from this meetup. And I think that's all. All right, thank you very much. And an applause for the comment. 90 seconds, roughly 90 seconds. Now so I'm going to, sorry? How about this? I mean, half, that's fine, right? Now I am not going to tell him what I think yet. Instead, you saw a test I performed. Yeah. Do you recall this test? You mean the questions or what? The questions themselves. Okay. Would you like to conduct this test on what you just said, the 90 seconds of content, but on your own without me? Of course. If you need guidance, I'm here, I'm happy to provide it, but see what the audience okay. basically got out of this. So three questions, guys. First, who am I? Victor. Right, Victor. Okay. Victor. I'm Victor. But who am I? I mean, what I'm doing. How do you get more input from a large group of people? Right? When you ask an open-ended question like this, you'll have maybe five people give you a shot at the same time, and it gets pretty messy. Yeah, so I should ask like minor questions like yes or no, right? Okay. And like raise a hand or like help him out, coach him a little bit. How what can he do? Oh, yeah, yeah. take from the audience, coaching from the audience. Thank you for the feedback, okay, sir. So the question will be, who remember, who am I? I'm in my, my uh, role, I'm in my career. I suggest, please raise your hand. Yeah, thank you very much. I think maybe not more than 10 person. All right, okay, cool. all right, let's meet the feedback. So what was the... Uh, what was the second point? Second question is, what are you doing? Please, guys, raise your hand who remember what I'm doing. Not so much as I expected. Oh my, we had an initial hypothesis and we have an immediate feedback loop. What was the final question? Yeah, and why I'm doing this? Please raise a hand who remembers this. A little bit better. A little bit better. Yeah, but exactly not the same as I expected. Understood. Now let's do something else now. I'm going to show you an example. That's promised. Dude, so how long have you been doing your work? I think more than 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. And can you break that down for me a little bit in a few few examples? What is this work fundamentally? Mm -hmm. Are you an engineer? Yes or no? Uh, no, I think not. What are you then? I'm a manager. What kind of manager? Uh, like the general management, you know, terms of this people management, product management. Which company are you currently employed with? Voiceo. It's called Voiceo. Voiceo. Yeah. How large is Voiceo? 
Maybe 100 people. 100 people. What is voice? So what is it about? What kind of company is it? Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be get a little tedious because I'm getting less interactive, but please bear with me. It might take us three, five minutes, okay? Please pay attention to the process. I do this quite a bit. So Voice of 100 people. What is the goddamn meaning of this company, right? The raison d'etre. What are you guys, 100 people doing there? Yeah, we are doing the contact center platform for small and medium business. Contact center platform. All right, let me ask you something differently. What happens to the world if your company goes bust tomorrow? I think nothing. <laughs> this man is super honest, let's give it a long pass, right? Yeah, we have a lot of competitors, unfortunately. Maybe fortunately, actually. You're the leader of this company? Uh, product leader. You're a product leader. How many people are direct reports? Uh, seven. Seven. Now, let's say if half the team leaves right now and you need replacements, and some of these new replacements are in this room, what are you going to tell them? Um, I'm not ready for this question, actually. But that's fine. That's know. guys. You can always tell me no. It's absolutely fine. Let me let me think about it. Sure, absolutely fine. So All right. I would say, like, I will tell you a little bit about the culture in the company because we are extremely open, and it's kind of startup, but we have we found our product market fit, so we have a money, and we have absolutely unique culture inside. So that will, that will be the first thing. Another thing that like we have a lot of opportunities. Absolutely. So you're talking a lot about the culture, but how exactly your, but how exactly your company changing the world? What you actually giving to the world? Because there is a lot of problems. That's a good question. Stuff. That's a good question. So you know, uh, I had a colleague. Uh, he said like he, uh, you know, he quit the job, and he said like, you know, Victor, contact center is not the product which you want to like. You don't want to have, uh, you know, more contact centers in the world, right? So it's not so challenging as you can think. But again, it's just in an industry, and uh, I don't have a beautiful answer for this question. That's but right. I will think about it. Good. All right. Okay. How can we improve the stock? So 15 years in this, you've been a general manager most of your life. Did I understand this correctly? No, I think I'm a general manager like three years. Three years. And what was your main job for the past 15 years? Before this? Yeah. I was an engineer, I was sales manager, I was a free sales manager, and I was product manager. Sales manager, engineer, and now you're a GM. Yeah. How many companies have you been employed with for the past 15 years? I think not more than four. Four companies. If you include all my startups, it will be like 10. How many times have you failed with the startups? Uh, six. Six, right? <laughs> and the company name? Should I? What's the company name currently? Voiceo, you mean the current one? Voiceo. Voiceo. Call right. center solution? Yeah. Voiceo.com. How, how many companies use it? Uh, I think right now we have 60, uh, 600 customers all around the world. All right. How many countries, more or less? Uh, I don't have the quick answer, maybe. Fair enough. Uh, Voiceo, how old? How old? Voiceo. How old is this? Yeah. Three years. Three years. Voiceo. Yeah. 600 customers. Yeah. 100 people. Yeah. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm the general manager of Voiceo. Voice is a company with three years in operations. Over the three years, we've been able to provide call center solutions to almost 600 customers. That's not my first company. I worked and managed in four, and I attempted to build 10 startups. Most of them failed. Now we have 100 people, and as a product manager, right now I have a team of seven, and I run this team like I did some of my startups. Same culture, but at the same time having the stability of a larger institution. Anyway, how's this version so far? Much better than mine, I think. <laughs> All right. Now, this was an example. Could you do something, final take, add a little bit more detail, add a few numerical bits of information, and please convey that this is a company you're employed with, you're leading people in it, and you want to invite some of the people here. Is that acceptable? I think, yes. Same basic structure, who you are, what you do, why you do it, but let's add some meat to it because we already received feedback that saying we have a unique culture is a little enigmatic. Yeah. All right, let's do it. One more take. Take the, as much time as you need before the next presenter. Next presenter is getting ready, okay? Okay, guys. So, I'm Victor. I'm a product director in Voice. Doing, like, we, we are making the contact center solution, and I have 
more than 15 years experience in telecom and in Boiso I managed a beautiful and extremely uh, you know good team of seven people who are doing extremely you know exciting product and I lost my thought again. That's fine, absolutely fine. How is he doing this time around? Ladies and gentlemen, what's the general feedback? Let's go broad a little bit. How's this, this version compared to his first version? More concise. More concise, what else? Positive, Positive detailed, detailed, and? More articulation. He's actually enunciating words. What else? A little more confident. He had time to practice, get used to the stage. Anything else? Easy to follow. Easy to follow. You actually started following what he's saying. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the feedback. Thank you for volunteering. Victor, you can do better with repetition. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Victor. Let's check the time. We have roughly seven minutes. I would like to give at least two more presenters. Whoa, Mr. Rocket right here. Please, send an applause for this man. Let's do it. Let's do it. Now, if you're not clear, why am I doing this, ladies and gentlemen? All right, that's fine. I'm taking something very, very specific right in front of you. And I'm using this as an outlet to provide and give feedback and to see immediate, immediate results to some extent. But the issue is, this is much harder for most people. No matter what you claim in the form, this is a classic, that ape response. You're in front of a lot of people. It's like a tribal thing. Now, most people find that to be threat of exclusion. But if you're able to tackle this, if you're able to actually receive feedback here and improve, you're more likely not to get defensive in those meetings. Now, notice when I am initially giving the, the microphone to you and I'm asking, hey, listen to the, the, the group, right? Try to do it yourself. I'm not immediately telling him what to do. I'm asking him to basically catch his own fish. And that's what a coach's job is. Now, to be fair, if I just keep going and asking questions from people, they'll be pretty annoying. Right? So I do have to give some answers. And that's the balancing act you guys have to have if you're running teams. So let's do this, man. You have roughly three minutes. In these three minutes, you can start who you are, what you do, why you do it. That's fine. Or you can do your own structure. OK. Um, so in the remaining one, seven, eight, one, seven, eight seconds, we will talk about my rem most remarkable parts of my life in LinkedIn or Instagram. And it's a quite long period, actually, because Manchester United in 1999 had scored two goals to reach the cup less than 90 seconds, actually. So at first, let me give you a secret. Who am, am I not, actually? I'm not a software developer, actually. <laughs> Nobody can force me to write eight hours a day code. That's why I'm here as a wannabe. Like, that's why I want to explore that environment and the world. Um, actually, uh, I ended up Estonia in age eight, not, um, 28, after four years of uh, like film industry experience and four more years in a mass media. In one word, who am I? I'm a storyteller in different purposes, actually. Like where even I wrote, I shot video, I edited, actually. For now, in Estonia, I'm working as uh, now as a like, writer, again, in a company which is based a bit CRM and a life cycle, actually. That's why each it really affected my even social media or mm, like entering to the websites because we know that even if we've been tracking like if you enter to a product and if and on three days if you don't uh, buy anything etc like there's another text goes to you like I'm responsible for the text part actually the the companies and let me stay my apologies that I'm intervening and interrupting I did not mean to interrupt too much having said this it would be most likely a fair assumption, ladies and gentlemen, that he is presenting you with a lot of information, a lot of different keywords. How many of you would be able to explain to a friend who he is? Please raise your hand. He is not a developer. <laughs> All right, let me put it like this. Who he is and who, All right. Not who is not, but who he is. Alien, account manager, storyteller, writer. writer. Okay. My kind recommendation, my editorial suggestion: What is the Pareto? What is the main thing you do? That you know. Mm -hmm. In one word, yeah, I'm. A, I can define myself as a storyteller, maybe. In which context? Um, 
actually it's reaching the people, reaching the people or telling the giving the message. Are you a freelancer? Also, yeah. You're a freelancer. I and was. I was also. Yeah. What Not are now. you currently doing? I'm currently uh, working as a position. It's written in my contract as a copywriter, content writer. There we go. So he's a copywriter, content writer for which company? Uh, the name of the company is Noble Minds. It's in Ulemiste. Noble Minds? Yes. Could you please slowly enunciate that? N A B U M I. And one N full full name now? Nabu Minds. What does Nabu Minds do? Noble Minds doing actually a CRM and like life cycle uh, management for whom? solutions. Uh, depends on, to the customers, like not only to one or two. Keep in mind, what will they remember? Right? Yes. Customer relationship management system, business intelligence, no, for whom? Right? Can you give us an example? Um, we, we've been doing, in like, how can I say, we've been doing like brand mm, management even or reporting. Like, we've been doing outsourcing, in one word, we've been doing outsourcing service. Okay, what's the challenge here that we're seeing? Dear audience, what's the challenge? It's all over the place. It's all over the place, but what else? Keep it dumb. Who is speaking? Please. Yes. It's, it's vague, ambiguous. Vague. vague and ambiguous. What is that likely to result in, dear audience? Confusion. Confusion. Dear copywriter, specific. Give me examples, please. One example. Oh, um, all right, a bit marketing text which uh, aims to um, inform people. Name a name of a customer that your company has. I can't. You can't. Okay. Can we say like company like an ogre or kind of? Kind of, kind of sure. Yeah, in Estonia, people really like to you know just write uh, write bottom of the website Coca Cola, Apple, Facebook. Like. Okay. Do you write copy for this company or others? Others. Others. Okay. So this is an agency or like you. So we are an agency. We can consider it as a kind of ad agency, but not directly. With a CRM component. Yes, yes. For the other part, of, yes, but because it's not. We are not on our department is doing that. We even also have some other services. Okay, well. Medic. How can you make it so specific that we can remember you? Because currently you're vague and over the place based on the feedback from the audience. How can we name one concrete example so we can really put a finger on what the heck does this copywriter do and for who? All right. For example, there is an e-sport tournament there. Yeah. So we Where? Are, I become a like as a, I feel myself as a teenager. Hey, let's go for the League of Legends. Is time is coming up for join for the tournament? Like. So you're writing copy for a League of Legends esports tournament. As an example, I gave you asked me for for a specific example. And so is that a common theme? Do you write a lot of esports tournament copy? Depends, yeah. It depends. Like if you even come to write us, us uh, you know, uh, if you have a um, gastronomy website. Okay. We'll so that. your name is once again? Milk. 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 And you're copywriter. How long have you been a copywriter for? Uh, actually, I didn't all, all my life. Uh, I did even like ten years long, I can say. But I didn't all, all only do this. I okay, we'll things. keep it simple so we can have time for another one. All right, Medic. Hi, my name is Medic. I spent 10 years telling stories. 10 years telling stories. And right now, my job is to write copy. So I'm a copywriter, I produce content. To give you an example, it can be an esports tournament. So League of Legends, massive multiplier games, and my job is to write copy that would get brands or attendees to come and engage with this. The name of the company is? Noble Minds. Noble Minds. We're based in Ulamista City, and we're a company of how many people? Um, 50 or 60 people. 50 to 60 people. Now, we are a bit like an agency, but at the same time, we're tech enabled, so we have business intelligence tools and a customer relationship management system. So if you guys have consumer brands, esports brands, anything from kitchen appliances, and they need to manage their accounts, clients, customers, and write copy and get the message out, talk to us because we are what? Name company. Name the company. <laughs> Just recall shortly number. 
Nabo. Hand of applause for this man. All right, Nabo. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what are we learning today in terms of comms and cons being concise and specific? What are we learning today? You need to be very honest with yourself. What does that mean? Being honest with yourself. What is this, gentlemen, what are you saying? All right, well, in no way we're implying any of the people here are ashamed of, all right? Listen, guys, so ultimate question in storytelling, if you may, or comms, is who you are. Another one is, well, why, causality, right? Something led to something else. Now, my hum humble experience of 10 years of working with a lot of the IT firms here, I meet, and this is the final note so we can contextualize and put a ribbon on it, because you've been a lovely, engaged audience. I meet people who run projects. Sometimes I ask them, listen, you're a project manager, what do you do? You know what the answer they give me? Manage I manage projects. <laughs> okay, then I start digging. It's like, listen, okay, cool. Um, what does that really mean? Can you give me an example? Well, we have this recycling plant for tires, and uh, my job in the company is to uh, get you know, the management to you know, sign off and finance it. And it's like, and I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm actively listening as a coach. And I'm trying to understand. Yes, please, sir. Can you name two of your customers? Um, some of these customers, yes. Okay, let's hear. All right, so not this one specifically, man. Okay. Not this one specifically, because otherwise I'm giving an example. But you have to understand I'm going for thousands and thousands of companies. So local IT firms, how many of you have seen me at an event or your company? Right? Please raise your hand. Right? Several people here. Right? Some of these could be Hellas. Some of this can be Nortel. Sometimes I meet a person from somewhere in America, just to contextualize this. Sometimes I work in the Middle East, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, right? A lot of the startups that you might hear pitching for three minutes, that's, uh, how should I put this? If you sh hear a shitty pitch, that's me. If you hear a good pitch, maybe that's me. If you see an excellent pitch, mm, maybe. Right, I train a lot of people, man, so long list of customers, man. A tremendous long list of customers. But if you ask me who am I proud of, well, one of them is in this room, Verk, right? So the CTO of Verk is right here, Marcos. Please talk to him. He's a lovely individual, and what I'm really proud of that, so appreciation feedback, is that they have integrated the feedback culture to some extent, right? So it's not just comms, but they're trying to keep track, manage your teams, talk to each other, be radically candid, be honest, and even in your fundraising trail. So I'm really proud of them. Man. So that's what one specific example in this room talked to him, okay? But going back to all of this, to be able to decide that you do your job not because you're getting a paycheck or somebody told you to do this job, you have to make, it's like freedom to be responsible. It's like you make your own goddamn path. I'm not doing this because somebody else told me to, not because I have to have a mortgage to pay and I have like five kids. You do the thing because it matters, because you make a goddamn choice. Agency, psychological agency. Otherwise, you're like a stick in a river. So storytelling, being clear, and being able to take feedback without getting defensive requires you to understand that fundamental thing. It's not about your ego. It's like, yeah, it's about you, but it's not about you. It's the ability to, con like, I'm doing this because of this. There's something bigger than me be that a Deref, be that a Nortel, be that a Helmus, be that Cybernetica, something is more important than me. It can be my team of seven people, right? Or it can be the thing the company stands for, and not in a cynical way. That's the why. Are you able to clearly understand what you do? Are you able to tell me examples, clarity? Have you put the mental effort to put it together? So who you are, what you do, why you do it. None of this is enough to make you great. Social physics, information flow. Robert Sapolsky has great lectures online. I highly recommend it to understand other human beings if you want to lead them. Now, Netflix has been uh, on a rough patch lately. Cul culture feedback, no rules, rules. And finally, would you like to guess the book? What's the book? Thank you for the feedback. The art and science of receiving feedback well. Now, public speaking today was just an example. My name is Gleb. Some of you know me. 
People who don't, add me on Facebook or LinkedIn. Happy to connect and just hang out. You've been a lovely audience. Thank you for submitting the forms. Next time somebody does something that you see could improve, be improved, give them corrective feedback. Pretty please with Sherry on top. Speak up. Thank you very much. We're done. with different flavors and yeah Maria right now is taking them off the fridge and yeah with this uh, I think Stas the organizer he already left uh, but uh, we, you're really welcome to hang out here for some time maybe chat uh, have some networking do some uh, talk to Gleb talk to other folks that you learned a little bit more about and yeah thank you we were really really happy to host you uh, hopefully you will come back maybe we'll have like a bigger <laughs> place next time or a little bit better air conditioning um but yeah thank you so much and uh, uh, have a nice time and the cake pops are there yeah <laughs>